and welcome to Meet the Healers. I'm Lori Krein, and today I'm super excited to have Juan Carlos Portillo. Uh, is that how you say your last name? Portillo. Portillo, okay, on the show. And Juan Carlos, uh, his business is called PortilloChiropractic.com is the website. And he's located in Willow Glen, California, in San Jose. And so today we're going to take a deep dive into his uh, practice and his theory behind what he does. So welcome. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. Great. So I read on your website your story about how you started in getting into chiropractic. Uh, you started in the medical field. You were going to be a doctor and you got kind of disillusioned. So can you share a little bit more about that? Uh, that whole path. Oh, I went wow. to a local high school in Palo Alto. It's Palo Alto is right next to Stanford University. So a lot of my, my classmates had parents that worked at Stanford. And during the summer, my junior senior year, I got to internship with a pulmonary specialist, Dr. Theodore from Penn State. Or actually, he went to Penn State. Basically, he was a football player, ex-football player, and I was a, a jock at that point playing football. So it was a great affinity with him. But he smoked and drank coffee. And this is the time where he would do rounds. He would be having a cigarette in his mouth with one hand and then coffee in the other. And then they had these, uh, we, when he walked into the, the cancer area where they had all the lung uh, people that are having surgery, he would stop outside. They had these double doors, swinging double doors. He would put his coffee down, put his cigarette down, put them down and then walk into the ward. And then you walk in there and you'd have, this is the time when they were doing really uh, invasive surgery. And people had lost parts of their faces and their mouths, and they would have they would be, you know have a holes in their throats. And he would go through his process of explaining what's going on post surgery, what, what was going on. Then he get to the other side, there'd be another double doors, and then he would light up and grab it, grab another cup of coffee. And I was a young person at that point, very impressionable. I really liked him a lot. He was very, uh, very friendly towards me. He took me under his wing, but it, it just created a, a conflict within my own psyche. You know, when you're, you're young, you have this idealistic perspective on life. And I knew that that wasn't healthy. And it made no sense to me. And watching the effects of cancer, lung cancer on people, it was pretty, pretty dramatic. I mean, people are losing part of their bodies. Um, some of them actually will stick the cigarette in the, the, the hole in their throat and smoke. And it made a bit, quite an impression on me. And it just basically confused me because <laughs> I... You know, I wanted to be a doctor, you know, the American dream, being a doctor. So uh, it just disillusioned me in the process. When I went to UC Davis my freshman year in college, um, I was in, they had, in Davis, they had these basement labs and you spend basically six hours a day in the lab uh, twice a week. And it's very, uh, I used to think, and you, you're doing very mundane, you know, studies about certain chemicals, not my field, not what I wanted to do. So I started reevaluating, well, do I really want to do this? And uh, that's when I started to change my perspective on medicine in regards to healing. Because at that point in my, in my life, I didn't see medicine as really uh, jiving with my philosophy on health. I was a jock. I knew how it felt to run, to eat, to just be healthy. And in surgical procedures and medicine, drugs wasn't something that I said that's not because that was the answer then you know we can improve upon it with medicine and surgery so it just changed my perspective and I started to question my lifelong goal it was difficult because emotionally it was very difficult to let go of that dream because you're you know, you're attached to it and you're young I'm as 20 um, and it was difficult so my brother my older brother who I'd lost contact with uh, he came back into my life and he was studying to be a chiropractor and I just abused them up and down. I mean, I was just, you know, because I had, I was in the model, you know, chiropractors are quacks. You don't know what you're doing. And he was awesome because he's, he was my older brother. So I had, I respected him. But he said, you know, when you're ready to listen, we can talk about it. Obviously, you're not ready to listen. So let's not talk about it because it's going to get, it's going to get, uh, con you know, it'll get angry here. He was older than me. He's five years older than me. So I, I respected him. Say, so okay, I'm sorry. But, you know, like, I, you know, I made up my mind. There's no way in heaven. I'm, this is ridiculous. And then five years later, was it five years later or something like that? Um, he moved back into the area and then we started hanging out together, playing uh, racquetball and playing sports. We're both athletic. 
And then I was more amicable at that point. I had basically dropped away from school. I had stopped taking going to school and I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I had it in my mind to go back to school, but life gets in the way. I got married, had kids. Mm-hmm. And then he came, came back into my life and I said, uh, you know, he said, okay, tell me about chiropractic. Tell me, you know, and then he actually started working on me. And to experience it as well as the, the philosophy of the, because chiropractic is a vitalistic belief system, meaning that the body is self-regenerating, self-healing. And that, I knew that. I knew that. Um, it has certain laws that we take care of our body, what we eat, what we breathe, uh, the people you hang out with, you know, the environmental, emotional uh, that you have, how that affects our bodies. So it just basically started ringing more true. And it, it, it had time had passed where I had lost a lot of my uh, prejudice from medicine and observing how to be healthy because I was a sugar addict and um, that was a challenge for me because you know in American diet sugar is everywhere and it's perpetuated by all kinds of mechanisms but anyway I had a lot of issues with sugar and I was always trying to break that habit and he explained to me the functions of, of you know carbs protein and fat and just it just gave me some perspective so i changed and i started to actually experiment with how it actually affected me personally and um, then i i I said okay i'm going to be a chiropractor because that's something that fits what i want to do is i want to be a doctor i'm an athlete i know how the body works and let's you know so that's why i I shifted and became i went to school (laughs) so when my my third my third kid was born in 1980 was 83 I uh, was born on, on Tuesday and I started school on Thursday and um, that's what happened. Wow. That's such a great story. I mean, uh, it, it's, to me, it's, a, it's such a, a, a perfect example of how our system is screwed up in, in, in the United States, especially because we get, um, I'm thinking about writing a book about this called America the Beautiful and the Beautiful's Crossed Out and it's America the Brainwashed. Yeah. <laughs> because we're brainwashed. We, with advertising, all the things that they tell us we should eat at the store, we go in all the processed foods, right? Um, and that's just creating illness and sickness. And we're, and then we get you know older, and then we get sick, and then we want the medical system to cure us when, in fact, all these foods that we've been eating cause most of the problems that we have. It could have been prevented very easily. And of course, it so feels to me like they're in cahoots, right? The food companies in with the pharmaceutical companies it's like let's get them really sick and then we have to give them pills to cure them and yeah i mean you know if you look at it from now in this point I'm, i've been a chiropractor for 30 plus years any you take any any metrics and the latest one you know in the united states ranks as far as they take all the top 20 industrialized countries by health and they have metrics of health measuring health we in the united states spend more money than the top 20 countries put together on health and yet, what would we get back? What do we get in return for our dollar? We rank 32nd in health on the metrics of health. And they look at, you know, blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, birth, birth rates, uh, childhood Ill- illnesses, childhood deaths. I mean, there's a whole metric spectrum. We rank 32nd. And yet we spend the most of the top, you know, more than top 20 countries put together. And it always cracks me up when I hear about America's the greatest medical uh, system in the world, and I go like, "What metric are you looking at?" <laughs> you know, because it's not what I'm looking at. Right. And you know, it's, this is kind of a confused, confused, very uh, mixed-up society in regards to health. Because healthcare is is personal responsibility is a big part of being healthy, and this is something the United States propaganda machine takes away from people, because you know we'll fix it. You're not responsible. Biggest challenge I have in my practice is. You're responsible for your health. I'm, I'll, I will assist you. I will coach you, but you're responsible. You're, you're responsible, and they want to give it to me. Here, doc, fix me all the time. They fix me, and I, and I, when I was young, I was dumb enough to take that responsibility on. That was foolish because I had all kinds of issues, difficulties, and challenges. But now I go, no, 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 don't do that. I mean, right at the beginning, I said, no, no, you're responsible, and a lot of people don't like that they, they want you to be responsible for their health and that's a big challenge because if you're not responsible how are you going to get healthy it's not going to happen you know because there's two things that the body has to deal with on a regular basis gravity and what are you feeding yourself every day 
you know, and we, uh, in, typical American will eat between 26 to 32 same foods over and over and over again. So I always, because I'm a nutritionist now, I, I, that's my specialty and I, I'll, I'll tell you about how I get there. But, you know, I always say, okay, now, are you eating into your genetic strength? Or are you eating into your genetic weakness? And if you have symptoms, if you have illness, it's clearly the answer. And I cannot make you change your diet. You have to change your diet. I will give you suggestions, but you're responsible. And that's the biggest challenge, Lori, because people, like, eating is more than just giving nutrition to your body. There's all kinds of emotional, psychosocial issues there mm -hmm. that are more challenging. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I totally agree with you. And I think that's why it's so hard for people to, to delineate between feeding ourselves for the nutrition part of it versus the emotional part of it. Exactly, exactly. I always ask people, what, are you hungry when you eat? Please start noticing, are you hungry? Because if you're not hungry, then there's other issues going on here. We need to look at that, you know? Yeah, exactly, because that's where the, it's either food or it's a cigarette or it's a glass of wine or it's, we have all kinds of things that we do to move away from whatever emotional feeling that we're having that we don't want to address. Yeah, so it I don't feel whatever I'm feeling. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like remember the Atkins diet, how, how mm -hmm. popular that was? And now we have the keto diet and all these diets. And diets are not going to do it. They're not going to do it. It's, it. it's about eating healthy foods and having a healthy lifestyle. So there's certain foods that we should not eat and then there's certain foods that we should eat. How do we know? Like for our, you said for, for specific individuals, everybody's got a different different foods that they should be eating to, um, for their own bodies, right? Can exactly. You... That, and that's the challenge right there because, see, nutrition, whether it's medical nutrition you know, uh, or so-called vitamins, this is the vitamin industry, they, seem, they always put this bell curve on people. And each, each human being is an individual biochemical system. And you have to look at that individual individually because you're not going to give this person – uh, you know, I could take, I could take potassium, magnesium, whatever, and, and my body will process it differently than you. So how do we discern what your body needs and what it's getting too much of? Yeah, that's the, that's the question right there. That's the question. So I came across this work, and this is something that's been done uh, back in, in the, I think in the 20s. Dr. Edwin Howe came up with this work. Uh, basically, at that, that point, they were having, they call sanatoriums. And you would go to the sanatorium. It basically, where they, they're just say, like what we have today. We go to a weekend at Asalon where you basically they cook for you, and they have your whole life, your whole week planned out with exercise, massage, and mindfulness mechanisms. So that they call them sanatoriums. And then he would go. He would work at a hospital and look at the illnesses because they had a lot of a lot of infectious cardiovascular disease and diabetes back then. And he would go to these sanatoriums and they, people would get better there and they wouldn't get better in the hospital. And he goes, what, what are they doing differently? The same, the same population is being exposed to this treatment and then this treatment seems to be helping. Well, then he looked at the places that were people were getting better and it was, they were controlling the food intake mm -hmm. and they were giving them whole fresh foods. They weren't giving them canned foods. They weren't giving them you know, uh, processed foods. So what's in whole fresh foods that's not in processed foods? And back then it was the canned foods. And so in order to can something, you have to heat it up and you put chemicals in it to preserve it. So then he, he looked at the issue of enzymes. So what every food has enzymes within the food itself that actually when you chew it up, helps you digest that food entity so the body actually gets it, assimilates it, utilizes it, and eliminates it. So it actually helps the body when you have that natural enzyme within the food itself. We have enzymes naturally in our, in our pancreas that helps break down protein, carbon, and fat, but it was never designed to all the food that we're eating to be processed that way. Because it was designed, if you eat a, a fresh fruit or vegetable and you chew it up, and again, key is to chew it up, you know, slow down, chew it up a little bit, that releases those enzymes, so it breaks down that food, so your body can utilize it. And the body will the nutritional impact is much more effective than eating something that's not uh, whole fresh. So we did this back in the 20s. So then he started realizing they got better because they were getting fresh fruits and vegetables. And then they developed a 24-hour UA because your urine is a 20 is a window into your biochemistry. So 
when you get a UA, typically in a medical doctor, they're looking for, they're looking for pathology. So they're screening whether you have blood, nitrites, protein in the urine. You're not supposed to have any of that. So that's what they're looking at. This is a functional UA. So you're actually you're discerning how your body is doing over a 24-hour period because you have a 24-hour sample, not just a small sample. And you're analyzing how is that body taking that food, processing that food, and how's the kidney function at the end there because how you're clearing it out. And through that process, we can discern and how that body is doing with, with that, 20, that, that day that, that that UA was done. So we can see where the body is you know, doing well and where the body is waving the white flag and where it's waving it really rigorously. And the big issue that I see clinically is a lot of stomach issues, a lot of heartburn. And heartburn is not a too much acid or too little acid nonsense. That's just, that's just mar marketing by the propaganda machine. What, this, what we're talking about is mucus. They don't produce healthy mucus because mucus is, lines all your mouth, your nose, your ears, all your, your tube systems, your, which are your lungs and your, cardio, uh, your uh, digestive system. Because mucus protects the lining that's, that is around the tube. And that lining is protein. So when you eat and you eat basically protein food, it, protein is digested in an acid medium. So your body has to get down to a lower pH. And if that mucus lining is not properly barrier between the food content and the lining itself, then you're gonna irritate that lining and you're gonna start having heartburn and eventually you could have an ulcer, okay? But again, it's, an, it's a mucus production because of the improper diet that's going on there. So it's not too much acid nonsense. That's just, anybody, anybody you do that doesn't know what they're talking about because you're talking about basically healthy mucus. And that's a major issue. And it's the interesting thing about this COVID-19 thing is that that's how the virus gets into the lungs. Mm -hmm. When that lung, you know, when you've done the, the mouth, the, the air passages, that mucous membrane is not properly functioning, that virus can get in quicker. So they're finding out that people that have compromised mucus lining of, of the air, airways are more susceptible for COVID-19 infection. So again, it's just how that plays out. But it goes back to specifically, we're testing each body Gets to, gets to be tested, okay, how are you doing with your diet? And then we need to make, you know, we have to make modifications with their diet, which is the biggest challenge, because people don't wanna change what they eat, but when they start feeling better, then things start shifting. So when you do that, uh, that urine test, the 24 hour, whatever the person eats that day impact the results of the test? And yeah. so do you have a protocol? Do you like how, what if you just that day you just ate super badly or you ate better than you usually do, then are the tests not going to be valid? Like how do you control for that part of it? Good question. Because basically people eat really well during that day <laughs> because they know they're being checked. So there's, there's a three, there's a three uh, process part of this analysis. Okay. So you're gonna come in um, fasting on the day that I'm gonna examine you physically. So you come in with at least a 10 hour fast. So then I'm gonna physically examine your body and there's reflex points that I, I'm looking for is for that affect to the digest, you know, how your body's doing with absorbing protein, carbon, and fat. And then I'm gonna feed you a, a, a powdered protein meal. It has actually a protein, carbon, and fat. So we're gonna test your, your capacity to, to digest this powdered meal that I'm gonna feed you. And I'm gonna wait 45 minutes and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the same exact exam that I did when you were fasting. And I'm gonna compare how you did with that. You should have easily digested this powdered meal because it's basically a plant-based protein, carbon, fat meal. And then I'm gonna correlate what I find on the physical exam with what I found on the UA. And I'm gonna put more emphasis on the physical exam because that's telling me right here and now what's going on. The UA is giving me that window when that, when that test was done. So I correlate that together and then I get a really good picture of what that person is having tr tr trouble with. So that's like kind of the first entry, the first entry point, I guess. Right. Uh, how, how do you go from there to here are the foods that you should be eating for you, this for this individual? We have these diets that we've have to discern over the years and it constantly adjusts depending on you know because it's uh dr loomis is who's my mentor he's in, in madison wisconsin and we people from the west say, you know we don't eat like you guys eat over here so we need to have a california diet so we have a diet guide this is a guide because we have divided up by acceptable and poor choices because they're 
you know, the good foods are in both categories, but depending on where your challenge is, that food is acceptable or poor. And I always tell people this, you're going to have symptoms within 10 to 15 minutes after you ate. And if your body is having a challenge with it, you're gonna have symptoms, okay? So gas, indigestion, heartburn, cramping is a clear sign that you're having stress with whatever you just ate. So start paying attention, please. You know, you don't wanna be keep eating those foods that are causing stress. So that's one aspect of it. And then I monitor them by those reflex points because those, believe me, they hurt. And when I palpate, they get a clear signal, oops, and they know, they know when they're, they're straying. They know when the, they keep eating the same foods, even though that they, they clearly the UA, the in exam says you need to ease off on this foods. And that's the biggest challenge because people are really strongly addicted. Maybe that's too strong of a word, but they really like certain foods and they don't want to give them up. Yeah. And again, I always think, I always tell people when you start feeling better, that's going to be the challenge. At some point you're going to say, okay, every once in a while, I'm going to eat this food because I love it but I know that I can't eat it consistently. And that's, that's what happens. But it's always their choice because they know, they'll, they'll have the symptoms when they eat it and okay, I, won't, I don't need to eat it every day, but I can eat it every once in a while. Well, I have this thing with Rocky Road ice cream. I love it. <laughs> but my body says, you know what? You need to be very moderate with that and you have to have a small portion because if you don't, you're gonna have, you know, I have symptoms. And there's some days where I can say, okay, I have a little bit. And some days I say, well, I want more. And I'll pay for it. And I'll go, okay, it's worth it. I'll go for that symptoms. But it always keeps me in balance because I know. And it keeps me moderate. As far as the dietary stuff, uh, I hear what you're saying that when you eat something, you'll have your body sh typically will have a reaction to it. Uh, you'll feel it. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my biggest issue is I have inflammation in my joints. And so that's caused me a lot of issues. And over the years, I've tried various things to try to uh, mitigate that. And so... Uh, what I've noticed is it's sometimes it's a cumulative effect. So I might eat, um, I don't know, let's say coffee is an example. I'll have a cup of coffee, I'll be fine. And then I'll, the next day I'll have a cup of coffee. And then five days later, I'm like, oh, my hips are killing me. And I'm like, maybe it's the coffee. I don't know. Let me stop drinking it. So my point is that, um, is there, are there cases when it's a kind of builds up over time? Is, is that also sometimes the case? Well, you bring up a, a different process here because it's, from wh what you're telling me, I would, I would look at your lymphatic system because basically you have lymphatic accumulation points. The lymphatic system is basically your body's way of clearing um, metabolic waste. And it sounds like you have accumulated, there's, there's four accumulation points that we need to check because that's a high priority that keeps the body from processing and, and healing. Um, so I would say that's what I would do with you. When you, t you tell me that, I would say, okay, let's see how your body's uh, is, is built up accumulations where it's basically all filled up and inflammation, anything can throw it off. Then we need specifically to mechanically, there's, a tech, there's actually a physical technique to drain that. Mm -hmm. um, then I would ask you if you need to, there's a certain stretches that I have you do, lymphatic drainage uh, movements. And then I would give you a specific uh, formulation that we have that would helps your body clear stuff through your breathing through your skin and and physically movement mm, interesting okay so there are some cases when it, it is uh, a different approach that needs right to be taken. yeah because yeah your body just doesn't have the energy to process it and this mm -hmm. is such a uh, take care of this now right now because there's there's no more room for um the body just just full it has no energy to do anything other than barely sustain itself at that point Interesting. Okay. All right. That's, uh, that's, I'm, I'm asking these questions based on personal experience, right? And no it's really yeah. it's just directly it's sort of related to what, what you're sharing with us. A few years back, about five years ago, I was, someone told me to try this ELISA 96 food sensitivity blood test. If you haven't heard of it, then we can just skip over the question. But uh, are you familiar with any food sensitivity uh, testing? And what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, well, there's, there's, more, there's more tests. There's all kinds of allergy testing technique. There's all kinds of blood tests that are going on here. You have to understand that blood tests, when you have uh, symptoms in the actual standardized blood testing, it's been in the body for a while. And when you start going off the normal ranges, the body can no longer maintain itself. So it's moving toward a disease entity. So um, the urine is basically a 
it's a much earlier mechanism. The body still has the ability to adapt and there's, there's no pathology manifesting yet. So we can make changes, but it's no longer, it hasn't gone to a disease entity. The allergy testing, it's not very accurate because there's so many other variables in play. Through the years, I've looked at various techniques um, and the ones that I still use are the ones that I've gotten consistent results that I can actually verify. Um, so therefore, I'm not really clear. I, I don't know, I haven't heard your specific one that you just mentioned, but it's been a whole slew of bl blood tests that are in vogue at the time that, you know, the greatest things is toilet paper and they will, they will lead you to health. And I just haven't seen consistently over time that that's actually true because the standardized blood tests, we look at that because that, that tells us, okay, is, is there a disease entity? Is the body can no longer maintain health or, you know, it's, there's no homeostasis going on here. And that's what the blood test is about. Um, and then if I want to know functionally what's going on, I go for the UA because that gives me a window at that time. And hopefully it hasn't gone into a disease entity because when you have blood, when you have values in blood and you have pathology, that system is not as, as resilient it's because it's fighting, it's having an illness and it's been over time that it has, and it has not been able to adapt. So no, I, I don't. Your test, I'm not clear about exactly. If you're measuring, what, what were they actually measuring? Um, so they did, uh, and it was 96 different types of foods. So mm -hmm. for example, um, and then it was like a little chart, which I could go grab it, but I don't have it in front of me, but, um, basically it had a graph and it said, uh, how sensitive are you to these foods? And so for me, for example, it said, um, eggs were very high sensitivity to eggs and to dairy, um, all kinds of dairy, cow milk and goat's milk and lentils and beans and, uh, cocoa beans. So for example, um, so that was those, those, so the, what the, the point of it was that to stay away from the foods that were um, high on the graph, which I had a high right. sensitivity towards. That's what it was supposed to tell me. Which is very typical to the, what those allergy, allergy testings are all about. They give you a whole list. And you ever notice that you have a whole bunch, everybody has a whole bunch of uh, foods that are high, high allergic responsing. So that it makes it difficult because, you know, People, I mean, diet is such a key, a key issue. That is actually the crux of the whole thing is what people eat. And if you limit a whole bunch of different foods, you, you're not going to win. People just can't not eat certain foods, especially if they have emotional uh, familial tendencies there already. And I think that um, one of the things for me that was interesting about taking the test, so I, I, I cut out eggs out of my diet and I very limit my dairy intake and um, I also try to do uh, wheat-free, gluten-free, um, but I didn't. I don't know what um, what I should eat. Like uh, obviously, fruits and vegetables are are good choices, right? Whole foods, healthy foods. And then you start reading stuff about you know, well, chicken isn't so great for you. Of course, red meat. Uh, you, you can go both ways. Some people say a little bit is okay, not too much. You know, then there's the whole. Um, the other side of it about how they treat the animals, but that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, um, yeah. And then there's the, the fats, right? You want to eat good fats and not bad. So then there's the fish, right? You eat a lot of fish. And then I just read something the other day about sometimes fish, if you have um, gout, if you have high uric acid in your system, you shouldn't be eating fish. So it's like all these things just sort of start to go like, what am I supposed to eat? So it sounds like your technique or your um, way to approach this is, is to do an immediate test and that gives you more information about what's happening in, your, in someone's system and then you can guide them in a more um, accurate way. Yeah, yeah, because remember, your body needs protein, carbon, fat. That is essential. And in our bodies, protein is, drives about chemistry. This is the challenge I get with people. The most ill clients I get are the vegans and the vegetarians because they're already having issues with what they're eating and they are, they're already having symptoms. So I always tell them at the beginning, we're going to have to, if you, this is really important to you, we're not going to be able to work together because in order for me to get you to the point where I'm going to get you healing, I'm going to have to eat, you're going to have to eat uh, meat-based protein because protein drives the biochemistry. And I'm a big fan of grass-fed organic food because yes, uh, the, mm -hmm. The industrialized protein production mechanism in this country is terrible, and the food they're they're make they're making those animals, you know, in pens eat food that they don't normally eat. So you definitely have to get organically fed uh, meat, chicken, egg, whatever. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is that but protein drives the biochemistry, 
And if, you, because tissue repair, regeneration, healing comes from protein-based mechanisms in your body. Every enzyme in your body, every chemical reaction in your body need, needs a catalyst, which is an enzyme. And it's, those are protein-based structures. When you eat protein, half of your protein gets converted into your body with carbohydrate or fat, depending on your body needs. Fat and carbohydrate cannot be converted to protein. And again, protein drives the biochemistry, okay? So it's just essential that we're getting a good quality protein coming into the body on a regular basis. And then, and this is the crux of the system that what I, what I work is that we have to repair your digestive capacity because most people are not able to digest the food, even if it's good quality food. Because over time, they've, the body has taken a big toll with eating the processed food-like substances that this country feeds everybody with, and they can no longer break that food down, assimilate it, tr distribute it, absorb it, and then eliminate it. It's just, the system's not working. When you chew and swallow, that is not, that's just the beginning of digestion. That is not digestion. And, you know, in this country, if you go to any pharmacy and you ask the pharmacist, what are the three most common over-the-counter meds that they sell? You know what they are? Number one is pain. So pain meds. Now, pain could be a digestive stress. Number two is laxatives. Number three is heartburn medication. And they'll switch back and forth. So heartburn medication and laxatives are digestive stress. Okay. And that's the most commonly over-the-counter medication in this country. So tell me we're not having digestive stress. <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's that's the over the that's the, the you know over the counter. I'm not talking about the prescription meds. Right, right. Yeah, well, that's where um, I know there's a lot of talk these days about the what's it called the microbiome. Oh yes, yes. In your gut. Yeah, the the microbiome. Oh, that's where I live. I live there, <laughs> because basically we're talking about the tube from your mouth to your anus is out of the body. Okay, it's out of the body. And when you get it, when the body gets into the, into the blood, it's in the body. So the microbiome lives in the tube from the mouth to anus. And all kinds of things are going on there that basically are symbiotic relationship. And interesting enough, you know, we're talking about viruses today. We have viruses in our microbiome. We have bacteria, we have fungi, we have parasites in the microbiome. But in symbiotic relationship, they actually help our immune system, help our, our produce certain vitamins. Uh, they keep our, our, you know, the nutrition gets carried out, waste product is cleared out. I mean, they're part of our symbiotic relationship and the nervous system is connected to that. The, the, the whole, our bodies are amazing mechanisms and the microbiome is an essential part of that healing. And when you eat so much sugar, in this country, sugar is a big problem, carbohydrates, processed carbs, because you're feeding the yeast. The yeast just loves sugar. So when you, they proliferate, and there's more than one kind of yeast, and when they proliferate, they have all this waste products, and your body's having a hard time clearing that stuff. And believe me, you have digestive stress when you're eating all this processed carbs. Diabetes, which is an epidemic in this country, is not a sugar problem. It's a fat digesting problem. People that cannot digest fat go to sugar to get calories. And over time, they, they basically hurt their pancreas and become diabetic. But I have multiple diabetics that, you know, we got to help you improve, eat your fat because you got to eat, uh, digest fat and then that'll reduce your sugar cravings. And then we can give you, you know, you improve your health. So in this country, because of the, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but back in the fifties, the sugar industry suppressed a paper about fat that, you know, because now we, back in the fifties and early sixties and seventies, we demonized fat as the big bad evil and that's cholesterol and that's heart disease. Well, they actually suppressed this paper. It was sugar that was causing all this problem. Sugar is the main stress of heart disease and all these issues here. So, but, you know, do you ever hear NPR talk about this? No. <laughs> right. Some of the things I read, especially about our brain, our brains need those fats to function properly. Oh, my goodness. The thing is that the brain is an energy hog. It, it, it claims it right away and it takes it. So our brain says, okay, we, we get the high quality energy and it prefers carbohydrate you know and carbohydrate is what it needs it it's high octane fuel so the the brain the eyes reproduction system gets the priority and then whatever's left everybody else has to fight over <laughs> okay but but the brain is, a, is energy hawk because look, look at all the things that are going on in the brain and carbohydrate has a bad name because of the, the quality of carbohydrate in this country but we need carbohydrates we just need the whole grains 
We need the, you know, fruits and vegetables, a good quality carbohydrate coming from an organic garden. Our body needs that. You know that lard is actually beneficial to the human body? Because it's, it's high dense fat and it has essentially both six, omega-3, omega-6 and more than that. And our, we've been eating lard since the beginning of time. Our ancestors would eat the fatty foods and give the lean meats to their animals. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've totally changed how we've eaten over time and thinking it's healthy. But if you just look at our, our overall health in this country, it's a clear sign that our eating is not healthy. Microbi the microbiome has more critters than we have cells in our body. Wow. There's, more, there's more parasites, fungi, yeast, viruses, bacteria, number-wise, in our microbiome than we have cells in our body. So does that make us, you know... Are we micro, microorganisms or are we human? <laughs> just, just for that. But all those cells need nutrition every day. So what you put in your mouth, chew and swallow, is how you're going to feed that system. So the question I always ask people, are you able to deliver the goods to those cells? And obviously they're not because they're, they're coming in and seeing me. They're having all kinds of issues as a result of that. But it's an essential part of it. What we eat, you know, we, we get there's a disconnect with how important, how we take better care of our cars. We, we're more picky about what kind of fuel we're going to put into our cars than the food we put into our bodies. I'm always like, what? Wait a minute. Aren't you more, more important than the car? <laughs> you know? Well, not only that, but I think part of the issue is just like smoking. Like you smoke a cigarette, you're not going to drop dead, right? And you smoke right. a few cigarettes, you're not going to drop. It takes years for that to happen. So we go, oh, fine. Look, I smoked a cigarette. I'm still here. I'm going to smoke another one. And the same thing with food. We put we, we eat and our bodies just are able to function still, right, for a long time before we start to fall apart, typically. I mean, not always. Sometimes it does happen earlier on. There are more immediate things that happen, like you said, with their indigestion and um, uh, heartburn and other things that are more immediate. But in general, we can, we can keep moving and functioning and doing our lives for quite a long time before we start to feel the effects of eating badly. So it's kind of like we're uh, a boiling frog, you know, the boiling frog story. Right? That's what just, I, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, that's, just, it's, that's true. That makes it challenging, yes. And then one day, you know, sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later, and then we get, all, get sick and we like, oh, fix me, just like you said earlier. And it's been a cumulative effect and we can reverse it though. That's the good news. Yeah, and thankfully, you know, depending on what age you are and how much recuperative ability you have left, the body can regenerate. It's an amazing system. Do you have any, like, one of your favorite success stories of someone that came in and was kind of falling apart or whatever, and then you work with them and change their diet and they just, you know, took responsibility and were able to turn it around? Well, you know, it jumps in my mind. I just saw a client last week who she's been through three gastroenterologists and she's got, they diagnosed her with uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which is a very generalized, what I call a garbage diagnosis. It doesn't really tell you anything other than you have been inflammation in your gut. So we, I went through the protocol, uh, examined, I mean, 24 hour UA, examined her and challenged her digestive capacity. And her stomach was unable to, uh, to just to had very little mucous membrane, uh, excuse me, healthy mucus, and therefore anything was irritating that stomach. And so we just basically, there's the formulation that helps uh, restore the mucous membrane of the stomach so they can begin digestion because your protein digestion is occurring in the stomach mostly. Carbohydrate goes into the small intestine and fat is in the stomach, but it moves down into the duodenum. But anyway, just in the first week, she felt better than she's, she's gone through a three-year journey with three gastroenterologists. Mm -hmm. And she just couldn't believe that it was that quickly that can happen. And I always explain to people, you know, your body can heal. It just needs the proper nutrition. You know, and, it's, and the thing with her is basically getting her to, to, the diet was an issue. So we had to guide her with certain foods. She needs to just basically cut, cut the insult. You know, we have to cut that down. Coffee being a big stress because she was drinking too much coffee. So instead of going from four cups, you're going to down to two cups. And then from two cups, we'll go down to one cup and then see how that works. So just in that short period of time, she got, she, she you know, she thinks I, I'm, I'm walking on water and it wasn't me. Just we just gave her some information that she just hadn't been, been access to, but her body wanted to heal. So that yeah. that that's just jumped out of when I said that. And, and also, Laura, I want to talk about as I'm a chiropractor and I still adjust. 
And the adjustment has a great effect on healing because there's a lot of research being done in New Zealand now. We actually have a, a chiropractor who became a uh, physicist, neurophysicist. She's doing research and she t ties all these neurological, uh, she's doing a lot of research. Of what, what does the adjustment actually do? And one of the, th the things that she's been doing this for 10 years now is that the, the adjustment has a neurological effect on the part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is right here, which is the executor of the brain. And it resets that mechanism so that body, that brain is more aware. It's getting present time information from that, the rest of the body. So all the 10 organ systems is getting direct information, accurate information, so they can make adjustments. So the adjustment has a great effect on maintaining that particular body so it actually has present time information. In a crude analogy, it's like rebooting the computer so the software goes doing what the hardware's doing even though we're much more complex than computer systems, but it's, people can understand that. So the adjustment plays a big role. I, I want to stress that because I'm a chiropractor, and when I adjust people and I improve their diet and have their ability to digest, the body has an amazing response. Yeah, I was going to just ask you about that. So I'm, we're both ready to transition over into that part of the conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, I, remember I, I said before, the two main stressors are structural, meaning how do we deal with gravity? That's the structural issue. And then the other one is, what are they putting in on the body on a regular basis? Like, what's going on when, when someone's walking around and then they come to, they get the adjustment, what, what's off? Like, is it just your, can you explain more about what, what happens? Well, it's, it's a complex system, neurologically and mechanically. There's all, you know, the systems are all connected, but the, the nervous system controls everything. And so just all these, you have what they call uh, sensory neurons for motor meaning that your, your body's constantly monitoring the system, how everything's functioning, and there's a constant communication back and forth of all the 10 uh, body systems, the cardiovascular system, the, pulmon uh, the, uh, the skin, the kidneys, the liver re reproduction. This, it's all being orchestrated by the, by the brain, the hypothalamus. It maintains awareness and control basically by you know, hormones or mechanical movement or changing certain neurotransmitters. It's an amazing, amazing system. And we don't know everything about it now, but we have a lot of information. Um, so one of the things that happens is that um, after time is that they, that communication gets a little bit hindered by the body system, whatever's going on with that nutritional component or that physical activity. So the brain is not getting accurate information. And, it, and it, it, it's adapting to what it knows. And so when you reset that information and get accurate information, it can adapt and make some compromises and maybe change the biochemistry of that particular organ system or that, that joint. And the body just can re be, be more healthy state. So that's what you're doing as you're adjusting. Um, you know, as, as a chiropractor, let me give you how I even got into nutrition. Because in school, you learn basic nutrition, you know, protein, carbon, fat. So when I first got out of school, I would get people to take uh, standard processing vitamins. And I would make sure that people, you know, whether you're a woman or a man, what, what hormone systems I was nourishing. But I could never tell if it had any effect. I would ask them, well, how do you feel? And they would say, I don't know. I feel, you know, I don't know. They would, not, they would be like, there'd be, no, there'd be no change at all. And you're taking, you know, high concentration foods. So it was frustrating because I go like, well, I, I, you know, it's, I don't know how to do this. But I, I would adjust somebody. Back when I was first out in school, I would see people three times a week for the first two weeks and then start cutting it back after that. But when I would see the same pattern three times a week and I adjusted it Monday, Wednesday, come back the same pattern on Wednesday, come back on Friday, same pattern on Friday. Following Monday, I could see the same. I go, wait a minute, I adjusted this area. Why is it still the same? Something's off here. And it was frustrating because I could not understand because I knew what I was doing was having an effect, but why wasn't it holding? Well, what holds the system? What, is, what are ligaments, muscles, and joints? They're approaching carbon fat derivative, and they're dependent on proper nutrition. And one day I happened to, we get in chiropractic at that time, we get, we get two what we call uh, uh, chiropractic propaganda coming in, uh, newspapers back then. And we used to get newspapers in, in our office. They were selling stuff, so you get them. And I threw, I just put it into the recycle bin. I just threw it into the recycle bin. It opened up to this article about Dr. Howard Loomis, which is my mentor about nutrition. And the, art, the, the title of the article, do you really want to know what, what, you know, the adjustment does not get the results that you want? So I go, oh, okay, I'll read that article. And so he had just written a book about enzymes and health. 
And so I read the article. I go, well, I need to read the article. And uh, I said, I called them up and I said, okay, I want to, you know, when's your book come out? Well, the book had not come out yet. He goes, well, when are you coming out to California to give a seminar? He goes, I don't come to California. I go, everybody comes to California. He goes, well, I don't. <laughs> so then um, I said, okay, fine. So I'll get the book when it came out. The book came out. I read the book. I booked the flight to Wisconsin because he got me to the point where he, he's a chiropractor and he says, this is how we, you know, the missing link of how the adjustments will hold. So adjusting somebody mm -hmm. three times a week is the band-aid mm -hmm. because that body is not getting proper nutrition to hold the adjustments. Wow. And that's what started me on the journey because that's what changed how my perspective, I don't want to be a band-aid. I want to help people get hit healthy. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I know some chiropractors, you have to keep going back forever and ever and ever um, because of that, It does because it doesn't hold. But it sounds like with the nutrition component, so you're uh, so you've got the you've got the chiropractic part, you've got the nutrition part, and it sounds like those two things are, are being effective for most of your clients. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because you're dealing with organic stuff. I mean, this is the I actually enjoy the nutritional component because I mean I'm I'm going to adjust, and most there's been some people that don't want to get adjusted, and that's they're far and few between. I you respect that, but when you adjust and you get people to respond, I see you know my walk clients every three weeks. So there, that's the time I haven't found anybody that comes in a three week cycle and doesn't need, doesn't need adjustments. They, mm -hmm. they all do. Now, if your kids are different, I've had kids come back and don't need an adjustment because there's, there's, they still haven't got damaged enough, but adults, adults, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's hard being on this planet. <laughs> it sure is. Any help we can yeah. get is, uh, is, is awesome. So, um, all right. Well, is there anything else that you want to share? What I like to do is I like to really stress, especially now with this COVID-19 has really pushed that same button again, is I want to stress how resilient we are. We've been around lots of years. This virus is not stronger than us. It's just a, it's just a virus. And our bodies have the capacity to deal with it, to be strong. You know, we talk about our immune system. You know, you notice that the country is, is referring to this, like this magic vaccine is going to come out and save us. But in reality, it's our ability to fight infection. We've been here since, you know, depending on which book you read, uh, 3,000 years, 10,000 years, 6,000, you know, I don't know, depending on which book you read, we're all, we've been here a long time. And there's been lots of viruses. And like I said before, when you look at the microbiome, we have viruses inside of our bodies. We have viruses in our skin. So yeah. it's, not, it's not them, it's our immune function and how healthy we are. Mm -hmm. which goes back to what are we eating on a regular basis it, of our emotional being. We haven't talked about the emotion component here because that's a very powerful force. You know, the term of stress, you know, I don't know if you ever heard of Hans Selle, but he wrote a book back in the 60s called uh, The General Adaptation Syndrome. He basically mentioned that the body responds to stress in, a, in an identical way no matter what the stress is, whether it's chemical, nutritional, or emotionally, the body goes through a, a general adaptation syndrome. And the first thing it does, it inflames. Inflammation is a, a, actually a natural response to stress. The challenge is, does it stay, you get stuck there chronically, or does it just go through the process of healing tissue repair regeneration? So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of how do we support ourselves to be healthy? And that's the thing we have to understand. We're resilient. The basic laws of human health, and we just follow them. We are strong, resilient beings. So don't believe the media. <laughs> they make us sound so freaking fragile. No, no, we're much, much, much stronger than, than they would have. And it's within our capacity to do that. It's, we have the ability to make some lifestyle changes because health is about what are you doing on a regular basis? And if you don't know, there's a lot of information. Um, people, there's people out there that can help you uh, become more aware if you have questions. But we're yeah. strong. My point being is that, hey, I want to finish up that. We're very strong creations that can endure and survive and thrive. If we um, if we take care of this this body this machine that we're walking around on the earth, we have to um, give it what it needs in order. Exactly, to, uh, and we have to become conscious. We have to become conscious because you know that's the thing about this country. I'm, I don't know what it is about this our culture, but it it seems to perpetuate unconscious behavior that people just do stuff without even thinking what they're doing. And to be healing, to be healthy, you have to become aware. In order to do that, it requires consciousness. Okay, 
I'm going to eat this because, okay, uh, I, am, I, I know that's going to cause stress, but I'm, I'm going to enjoy it anyway. Or I'm not going to eat that. Or I'm going to exercise regularly. Or I'm, or I'm going to hang out with good friends. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop, stop seeing that person just likes to complain all the time. And those are conscious choices, but we have to become aware of that because what gives our body that, that environment, that nutrition, that emotional space that we're on, I'm actually feeling healthy, feeling happy, feeling joyful. Yeah. And it, the, that's a choice. You know, I, I want to stress that it's a choice. Yes. And don't get, because uh, people get so upset when, you, when I bring that up and I go like, no, 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 I want to encourage you. You know, where are you? Let's take you where you, you are and we can go from there. Because right. uh, there's, there's so much uh, anxiety and uh, fear. You know, it's just, it, and it's, and it, unfortunately, this whole thing with the virus thing is, the fear mm -hmm. phenomenon has just gone off the charts. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, uh, thank you so much for being on the show at Portillo, P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O, chiropractic.com. Correct.